Hello, we're back. This is the training division. I'm Lieutenant Barefoot, and to my left is Sergeant Bartley. We're from the training division, and we are here to talk about training today. Uh, we did a uh, Facebook um, about two weeks ago where we um, did a multitude of topics. Um, so we hope we get a lot of questions from the public today. Uh, we talked about Community Week, uh, which involves our recruits. Uh, they go to the academy for about five to six months, and uh, one part of it is community week where they go out into the community, uh, they meet with church members, they go out to the community to um, help individuals that need help with their yards, they go to the homeless shelter, which is a day, day shelter, uh, they go over there to help individuals, talk to them, see what their days are like, and organize uh, various items during the week. They also get to talk to people about views uh, from the community's aspect involving uh, police and what their views are on police. And then we have the recruits talk to them. Um, it's good dialogue. That's about two hours. Um, and that pretty much takes care of community week with also Pastor Cheeks that, that heads that program up. We also um, are involved with CALEA, which is a accreditation that we have uh, through the department. We have our training division, we have our communications division, and we have general patrol, which is certified. Um, in Newport News Police Department, only um, nationwide, we have less than 5% of the departments that are accredited in those three areas. And the Newport News Police Department has been accredited in those three areas. Uh, for now, I want to say over 10 years, um, and we get accredited every two years, um, and we just had our accreditation in 2019 and passed in all through three areas. Uh, Sergeant Bartley, would you like to talk about the FTO program, sir? Um, yeah, actually, before we jump into the uh, field training program, um, talk a little bit about the academy as kind of a starting sure. point. Um, so. Our academy runs for six months. Um, during the course of that, we have DCGS requirements that we have to meet. Um, and just to give you some idea of how progressive our agency is with training, um, we chose to move away from the regional academy some years ago um, because we felt that our officers needed um, and, and our agency deserved a higher level of training than we were receiving there. Um, that's not to suggest that the instructors at the Regional Academy are, are not competent. They are, they're highly competent people. The problem with a Regional Academy is that you have to train um, some very baseline concepts so that every agency gets the same training that goes to that Regional Academy. Um, but because each agency has different environments that they're trying to police, whether it's rural, rural or urban, um, and um, variances in, in uh, level of population. Um, and then just the general policies of each agency are, are somewhat different. So um, what we wanted to do was to create a training program that's centered and focused on the Newport News Police Department and the needs of the citizens in Newport News um, and, and the needs of um, our, our businesses and the urban environment. Um, so aside from the DCJS standards, um, we have added a great deal of training that is focused on Newport News. Um, and um, you know, to give you, give you some idea, we do a great deal of de-escalation training. Um, that's not something that's a new concept for Newport News. We've been doing that for many years. Um, whereas, you know, right now we see that as part of the national narrative. Um, but for Newport News, that's always been something that we've trained on. Um, we also just generally, we take a DCGS standard, we meet it, and then we exceed it. Um, and that's why our academy right now is about six months long. Um, I know Chief Drew has been talking to us about extending that academy, um, and I'm all for it. The more training these guys get before they get out into field training, the more successful they're going to be when they get there. Uh, so, 
Um, if you have any questions specific to the academy, please ask um, because there's there's a ton of information there. Um, as far as field training, so our field training program um, is roughly two months long, but it can be extended beyond that. Um, and it's all dependent upon the individual officer as they're going through the field training program, how quickly they're picking it up, you know, how quickly they are um, kind of becoming um, confident and capable of doing the job on the street. Um, but the general program is two months long and you have, um, we used to have our trainees rotate from through all three shifts, day shift, evening shift, and, and night shift. Um, but now they get sent to one shift um, and they stay with one field training officer. And then once they complete their field training, they're put out on the street with that shift. So they've gotten to know all of the officers on the shift and they've built relationships within the shift. Um, so we think that that makes them more effective as an officer on the street um, because that, that will make them more comfortable with their environment that much quicker. Um, and that, that was something that Chief Drew brought in um, and it, it seems to be working pretty well. So um, just recently, so we have a crisis intervention training program. Um, that's here in Newport News Police Department. We partner with Community Service Board, and we roughly have around 80 uh, employees that are certified in that program. However, uh, the chief has given us a goal that he wants all of our police employees to be certified in crisis intervention training within a two-year period. Um, that's roughly 460 individuals that are sworn so that's a lofty goal. However, we are partnering with the Hampton Police Department to come up with a program with Community Service Board support. Um, and over the next two years, we hope to get um, most of our employees certified in that program. What it allows us to do is have employees learn about specific issues that uh, people are going through in the community, um, mental health issues per se, and we work with Community Service Board to uh, try to alleviate or uh, help us when we go to those calls for service. We actually put those employees that go through the CIT program in situations, and we want, we want them to talk to those individuals to make sure that, is this a law enforcement matter or is it a Community Service Board matter which deals with mental health issues? Um, and having that partnership really helps us engage um, with those individuals and come out with a positive outcome because um, we've seen it throughout the nation sometimes uh, when, when the police go out and they have a mental health crisis with an individual. Uh, time is on our side in a lot of those matters and we need to take a step back, understand their point of view and make sure we get them the help they need. Um, so it looks like we got a question. Um, we also have a comment from Connie Lynn um, from Clearwater, Florida. Um, wow. Thank you very much. Um, we, we really appreciate the support. Um, the question we have um, is in reference to our recruits and asking if it's mandatory for um, new recruits in the academy to be exposed to tasers, pepper spray, and canine bites. Um, so yes. Um, now, all of this stuff is, is done in a training environment and it's, there's a lot of safety parameters put up around it. Um, so it's very safe when we do these things. Um, the reason that we want the recruits to experience this kind of stuff um, is with the pepper spray in particular, um, if you use pepper spray, there's a very good chance that um, you could get overspray on the officers or as you come into contact with a suspect, they could get some of it wiped off on them. So they need to know what type of effect that is going to have on them um, so that they know that they can work through it. Um, it, it makes for an interesting day with the recruits. Um, they, uh, they don't enjoy it, let's say that. Um, I know I didn't when I went to the academy, but it was absolutely useful um, to understand how I'd be affected. With the tasers, um, there, there are several reasons for us to do that with tasers. Um, the primary reason is so that the officers understand 
um, what a taser exposure feels like um, because the, the taser um, can um, cause what's called neuromuscular incapacitation, which means that due to the current, um, your muscles expand and contract very, very rapidly, which essentially makes the body stiffen. Um, it is not in itself harmful, um, but it can, if a taser is taken from an officer and used on the officer, um, it can incapacitate the officer momentarily, which we obviously don't want to have happen. Um, but another reason for the taser exposures is we want the officers to understand what that feels like um, because it, it it is not comfortable. Um, and we want them to understand that. We want them to understand how it feels um, because we don't want them to use a taser needlessly. If they're going to use a taser, they need to have a good reason for it. They need to understand why. Um, and we want our officers to be empathetic and sympathetic when they're dealing with the suspect and using force. Um, as far as the canine bites go, um, the, the canine unit comes out and they have bite suits and we will have the students get into the bite suits so that they can experience um, what it feels like to be um, taken into custody by a canine and so that they can each see how that works because if it happens out on the street and they've never seen it before, um, they may not know how to react to it properly. Um, and along with all of this training, we also give them very specific um, training on how to look for any type of health issue that might arise from any of it so that they can, if they use these items and somebody has some type of medical difficulty or injury, they can immediately assess that and get that person help. So um, something else I wanted to bring up. So we've talked about um, what we want to accomplish in next year's yearly in-service, which all the officers go through. And one of those things that have come up that Chief Drew would like for us to do is implicit biasness. So what we did was we had a um, training that came up, which is train the trainer at the Newport News Police Department. That happened approximately two months ago. And the trainers came in. We had approximately 10 of our individuals from the Newport News Police Department that went through the training, as well as as far as from Arizona, um, Wisconsin. We had a full room of 30 students that uh, attended this training. And what it teaches us is to know what people think um, when they first see someone, everybody has biases. Um, and if we notice what or notify what those biases are for individuals, we can overcome uh, what we think and then get to know those individuals and figure, okay, I had a bias when I first saw this person or observed them. However, that's not the case once you get to know them. So what it teaches us is to treat everybody the same, obviously. Um, and some of those biases come out from growing up, from the environment, um, from media and, and other social media outlets. So um, we'll be teaching that course to all the individuals in Newport News Police Department. They'll have that training in the first quarter of our in-service, which will probably start uh, around March. And by the end of March, everybody on the Newport News Police Department will have that training. Uh, do we have any more questions? Nothing yet. Nothing yet. Hmm. So, let's see what we want to talk about. Um, so, you know, we, we can talk just generally about use of force. Um, so, um, <clears throat> with the academy and within service training, uh, we try to um, give as much training on use of force as we can. Um, and, you know, in the academy, the training is very baseline. We've got to start them at the beginning and, and work their way through it. Um, when we talk about use of force, we're not talking about just the application of the use of force. We're not talking about um, the mechanics of it. Um, we start our officers out by teaching them about the legalities of use of force. We want them to clearly understand um, the law and case law as it pertains to use of force, um, when they are allowed to use force and when they are not. And even more particularly than that, we want our officers to understand 
um, appropriate levels of force. Um, you know, the law allows us to use force in order to um, make apprehensions, to secure a scene, um, and generally for public safety. Um, but just because the law allows us to use force doesn't mean that um, we can use whatever force we want. Um, and our department takes that very seriously. And we make a great effort to ensure that everyone understands when, how, and why they can use force. Um, so we give that all to them in the academy. And then every year as we do our in-service training, which our department, we generally do 40 hours of in-service training for every officer on the agency every year. DCGS only requires 40 hours every two years, um, but we like to give them essentially double that every two years. Um, and each year, we provide them with case law updates, um, particularly about use of force. Um, and we try to put them in scenario-based training in order to um, help develop those skills and drive those skills home. Um, and that's something that many agencies don't have the opportunity to do uh, because they don't have a robust training staff within their agency the way that we do. Um, our current training staff with the lieutenant, uh, myself, um, and then we have one other sergeant, and then we have six officers assigned to the training unit, uh, which is, it's a very robust training unit. Um, we would always like to have more, because the more we have, the more training we can provide, but uh, I do understand, you know, Chief's got a lot of manpower issues that he's got to cover all across the agency, not just in, in the unit I'm in. Um, but um, I think if you look across the board, I think you'll find that our agency does a better job of developing our officers when it comes to use of force than you'll find at many other agencies. So just commenting on the uh, use of force, um, I wanted to bring up that Chief Drew's uh, always thinking and, and inviting civilians in to help us with our processes, which would be promotional processes, but he also helps with we have a uh, use of force review board. Um, we usually have four citizens that come in. And when we do that, um, they get to see the raw footage of the video from the Axon camera. And we don't bleed out any video portion of it, whether it be verbal or the view of itself. Um, they get everything we see. And we've been doing that um, for over a year now. And what we get a lot of times when training's in there to um, listen and to discuss, maybe the civilians have a um, question for the training division or even our own um, personnel, what we get is why did it take so long for the officers to apply any type of force into that situation? Um, and when we discuss that in those matters, the officers are using de-escalation de skills, they're using their verbal skills quite a bit, um, and most of the time, the officers um, don't want to have to use force. They're trying to use every other scenario, time on their side, creating distance uh, before they use force. And that's one of the couple of reasons why um, it does take them so long to use force. We're just looking at questions. I'm sorry. Would you like to read that or... Uh, so the, the question we have, um, kind of a statement, uh, more than a question, um, but they're saying 40 hours a year is not nearly close to being enough. Um, you know, I, I would agree. Um, I would love to do much more training than that. Um, but with the manpower that we have in the agency, um, we have... Um, we have to have that manpower out working the street. So um, we can't bring everybody in um, much more than that. Uh, we, aside from the 40 hours though, we also provide, um, and that's our in-service training that's required for every officer. We also provide additional firearms training, defensive tactics training, um, and um, other classroom training throughout the year and officers can go and 
to those classes at any time. So they actually will, every officer will get more than 40 hours, but that's our minimum requirement to maintain their certification as a police officer. Um, so um, another part of this um, was suggesting that we should uh, make everybody a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu jiu blue belt at a minimum. Um, I would love it if we could do that, um, but um, I would imagine that um, Joshua knows that that takes a great deal of training um, and to be able to do that within the agency, um, probably not going to make that happen, unfortunately, though that would be nice. Um, but unfortunately, we, we just don't have that kind of time. Um, but I do agree, 40 hours is not enough. Um, so something else that we uh, spoke about in the other um, webinar we had was we have a crisis incident stress management team uh, for the mental health of our employees. It was started roughly over five years ago. We um, had the program, we had helped develop the program from the Norfolk Police Department. Um, the individual was Chris Scallion, who was a sergeant there, and now he is a national speaker uh, nationwide. He has helped hundreds of officers uh, through crisis, um, whether it be personally, professionally, um, anything that they might need, he has helped them. And we have developed our program from the Norfolk Police Department, like I said before. It's a robust program. Um, we've used it uh, multiple times at our agencies. We've gone to other agencies and helped other employees uh, going through crisis. And we've also um, had Hampton Police Department come over and help us when we've had a uh, major crisis too. So I thank them also. Um, but it can be as far as um, a personal issue. They'll get with a peer who's been trained in uh, CISM, which is short, short for Crisis Incident Stress Management Team. And not everything gets reported. We just say, hey, we've spoken to somebody. We don't talk about the subject. We don't talk about who we spoke to. And we provide those numbers monthly to our executive staff so they can, uh, they'll be aware of how many people are being helped um, and that the program is relevant. It looks like we have another question. Um, oh, okay. Tim is asking, uh, what are some things that you do differently than other departments? Um, so one thing, just to note that just about every agency out there has a slightly different take on how they operate. Um, so you'll be able to, if you watched um, two officers from different agencies handle the same type of call, you would see some minor differences. Um, but on a, on a larger scale, some things that we do differently. Um, so we do like the, the implicit bias training that the lieutenant was talking about before. Um, every officer on our agency is going to receive training in that, um, not just a handful. Everyone will receive training in that. Um, and then another thing that um, our chief wants is every officer on this department to be CIT trained, um, which um, it's crisis intervention training, right? Um, what they want is that every officer has that training so that whenever we go out and we deal with someone um, that has, is, is going through any type of a mental crisis, that our officers actually have the training and understanding of how to cope with that um, without resorting to traditional police tactics. Because um, that's something you're seeing nationwide. Um, we're seeing more and more of it where, you know, the police, they've been trained to enforce the law. Um, and, you know, their training otherwise is pretty limited outside of that, but then the officers are expected um, to deal effectively with someone who's in, in mental crisis. And, you know, we all like to think that we're good communicators. Um, we all like to think that we're good at our jobs. Um, and, you know, for the most part, we are. But that's something that's kind of outside of the scope of our training. Well, in Newport News, we are making that a part of our training. So that's an example of how we do things differently. Um, we, we see what the problems are, we find solutions for it, and we implement those solutions. Um, oftentimes, eight smaller agencies um, don't necessarily have the capacity to do that. Um, and some agencies are just not as progressive as our agency is. So 
um, we're doing really well in that realm. Um, I, I'm sure if we got down into the, the bare bones of it, we could find a lot of things that we do differently. Um, but that's kind of the big picture. So we have a couple more questions. Is there a weight and health requirement for Nieper News Police Department officers? Um, what I would say is when you first get on the department, there are requirements. Um, you have to do as a run with a time on it. Um, you have to also lift up a 175 pound dummy and drag them backwards. Um, you also have to be able to uh, pass mental requirements that we do and also a polygraph. Um, now, once you're on the department at that time, there's you have a health physical that you go through, but as far as physical standards, if you can do the job as far as movement from the patrol vehicle for foot pursuits, wherever it may be, uh, yearly standards, PT standards, um, I would say no. Um, Sergeant Barley? Uh, yeah, um, the, the only unit within the agency um, right now that well, actually, there, there's two um, that actually have a minimum PT requirement every year is, uh, one, the Tactical Operations Unit, um, which most people commonly refer to as our SWAT team, um, and then the Marine Unit. Um, those are the only two units that I'm aware of that have a PT standard, um, and that's because of the nature of what each of those units does. Um, but as far as the rest of the department, yeah, there's not, there's not necessarily a PT standard. Um, we certainly encourage people to stay fit and healthy, um, not only because it makes them more effective at their job, um, but even more so because, you know, if you stay healthy, you live a longer, happier life. Um, and we would like to see that for all of our employees. And I'm happy to say that our insurance company has a program um, that they offer where they have free coaching. They'll send you a scale at your house. Um, you take your weight and then you input everything you eat um, during the day as well as any activity you have and it tracks the number of steps you take and I've been on the program for about three weeks now um, and I am six to seven pounds down. Nice. Nice. So, Good job. Um, so David had uh, a question about what um, citizens can do to better understand um, what the police um, deal with as we're out on the street. Um, so I, I think probably the best program that we have in place right now is our Citizens Police Academy. Absolutely. Um, and if you go through the Citizens Police Academy, and I don't know the full details of it, how long it is, um, but I think it's maybe one night a week um, for a couple hours um, and goes over the course of a couple of months. And um, you'll get to see firsthand um, some of our training um, and you'll have officers and supervisors coming in from all the individual units from around the department to explain to you what it is we do <clears throat> and how we do it. Um, you'll get everything from patrol um, to um, the hostage negotiation unit to the SWAT team um, to the K-9 unit to major crimes. Pretty much get a little touch on everything that we do and I think that's probably the best way to go about that. Um, do you want to bring up the Milo system at all? Just um, to hit well, on that a little bit. I think we have a, oh, another sorry. question, maybe. Mm -hmm. Do we? No. Okay. Um, statements. Yeah, statements. Uh, yeah, we're glad to be CLIA certified, as we brought up. We had a um, statement that, from Lynette that she's very happy that we're nationally recognized as a Newport News Police Department agency in all three areas. Um, so I do appreciate that comment. Thank you. We work very hard. Um, not only do you have to have policies in place, but you also have to have um, us following those policies. So that's where the assessors come in um, and look at what you do, and they ask questions and documentation uh, to back up what you're saying you're doing. So yeah, I appreciate that comment. Thank you. Um, so you were you were mentioning the Milo system. Um, yes. Yeah. If, if you want. To Talk about that, and then we um, kind of do a little compare and contrast with the the live role player training we do. Sure. So we we have partnered up um, with ECPI, which is a uh, local college, and they have a system called Milo, which is able to put individuals, uh, civilians, in scenarios what police police employees might go through. 
Um, it can be traffic stops. It can be just talking to an individual with a mental health crisis. And some of them will uh, cause a reaction uh, for the civilian to go through. Um, and they'll see how fast, it, how fast something can unravel um, and to make a decision in a split de second decision and they see what police go through nationally in that little clips of what how they reacted to a situation. And then we get to talk to them about it and why they did what they did um, as far as a shoot, don't shoot scenario, for instance. And so that's something that we will utilize to train our officers as well. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very good training. Um, but one of the things that we like to do um, in Newport News is we like to have multi-layered and leveled training. Um, and a part of that is, you know, if we're going to train with the Milo system, which is video based and there are only a certain number of reactions that those videos can give to you that are pre-programmed into the system. Um, so to complement that and, and expand beyond it, um, we do a great deal of scenario-based training. In our scenario-based training, um, we have live role players um, that can give essentially any response they want. Um, we, we do generally put parameters on it so that we can draw out very specific things, that responses that we want to see from our officers. Um, but when we do this type of scenario-based training, um, we have training gear um, that they, the officers will wear. And for us, the training gear consists of everything that you would normally have on your duty belt. You have a simulated training item there. So we have uh, pistols that fire marking rounds, just paint rounds. Um, we have tasers that will fire... Um, cartridges that don't actually have darts in them, but they will go out, they will do everything the taser normally does aside from actually provide an electric charge. Um, we have practice batons, we have practice, uh, you know, just inert pepper spray. Um, and we have everything that they would normally carry. That way when we send them to a scenario, they don't have an understanding of, well, let me back that up. They don't know what's about to happen because if you just give the officer just a sim pistol or you give them just a can of pepper spray, then they know they're going to be using that item. We give them everything and then we send them to a dispatch for a domestic. So when they get there, they have no idea what the end result is going to be. So they have to make good decisions on understanding what's being said to them and what's happening in front of them and they need to make a good, solid decision on what type of force to use, if any. Because we also put our people through scenario-based training where they go there, they may think that they're walking up and it's gonna be you know, the, the gunfight at the OK Corral, and they walk up and all they have to do is do and say the right things to the person and the person will calm down and do everything they ask them to do. Um, you know, So we like to set things up that way that way we get true responses from our officers. And we find that that is a much better training um, program than you'll find a lot of places. Um, so I'm gonna add, answer David's question. Um, how does one go about qualifying to attend the Citizens Police Academy and being exposed to the Milo system? So what I would do, David, is you can go on our website, you can contact Captain Tegents, which is part of our community outreach. And we can definitely get you involved with the Citizen Police Academy. And we can also see if we can set you up with an uh, example or to go through the Milo system, if that'd be okay with you. Any more questions? So Sergeant Bartley had brought up in reference to having everything on your belt when you go through a scenario. Uh, a while ago, years ago, um, they'd hand you a taser and that would be it, or they'd hand you a, a blue simulation gun, firearm, and go through a scenario which you knew you were either going to talk to them or you use a firearm, and that was it. However, with everything out in your belt and having that um, at your convenience where you can use any of those items or just verbal um, speaking with somebody, it's been a fantastic way to go through these scenarios. And I've, I actually um, 
I have observed it through the officers going through it, and it has been eye-opening. I'm glad our training division has moved into that uh, route. There you go. Okay. That's just one. Thank you. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, myself and Sergeant Bartley really enjoy talking to everyone and very excellent, good questions um, and comments. Uh, they were all positive, which I, I appreciate and we appreciate. And we, we, really, um, we really enjoy your support and let you know that we have an excellent police department and the training division is bar none, one of the finest on the East Coast. And I appreciate everything they do with us in our department. And thank you guys very much for uh, being here in the questions. Um, it was enjoyable on our end. Um, and anytime that anyone has any questions for our training unit, um, we're pretty easy to get in touch with. Um, you know, we've got the, the main number to the police department is 928-4100. Uh, you call that number and they can get you in contact with any of us in the training unit anytime.